Beloved of God, beloved of Trumpet of Salvation, Shalom from Tel Aviv, Israel, and welcome to In the Gap, where we bring you the truth from a biblical perspective about Israel and the world. And I'm so thankful that you are with us, so thankful for this glorious relationship, friendship that we have with you, who have come to understand the work of the Lord in the midst of this mission. Last week, we had a very special guest with us, Dr. Michael Mach, who spoke with us about how, despite the clear message of the Bible, the early Christian church decided to turn its back on Israel and on the Jewish people and replace them with the church. This mistake was the cause of thousands of years of persecution of the Jewish people by the church. And in the end, it caused a rift which seems irreparable. We want to continue today to delve deeper into this topic as there is so much more to discuss. Stay tuned as we separate fact from fiction and learn the biblical truth about Israel and the Christian church. But first, let's get an update on what is going on in Israel today. Thank you, Jacob and Elisheva, and welcome to Israel Update, your source for Israeli news from a Christian perspective. I'm Sagi Cohen, and here is today's story. The Palestinian wave of terror has not subsided and continues to target innocent Jewish people on the streets and even in their own homes. Last week, Dafna Meir, a 39-year-old mother of six, was brutally murdered in front of her children at their home by a Palestinian Arab who then fled the scene. In Jerusalem, the city train was stoned again by Palestinian Arab youth, terrorizing innocent Jews. The following day, Molotov cocktails were thrown into a Jewish home in Jerusalem in an attempt to murder more Jews. There were no fatalities reported in either case. This has happened in the past as we read in Nehemiah 4. Our enemies said they will not know or see until we come among them kill them and put a stop to the work. But the Lord will stand with his chosen nation, Israel. And as before, so today, as we read in Psalm 31, let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Please pray with us for the lives of those lost in these unprovoked attacks and to the well-being of their families. And please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. Back to you, Jacob and Elisheva. Thank you, Sagi, and welcome back. We want to conclude the interview that we had last week with Dr. Mach. Let's uh, take a look at it. We are talking today with Dr. Michael Mach. And again, thank you for coming and being with us. And we uh, really want to understand this theological issue of how the Catholic Church have begun. This is, this is something that have brought such confusion into world religion, into the world altogether, out of these disciples from Galilee, Peter become the first pope. I mean, how this whole confusion have really crept in to the world and to the church, so much so that the Jewish people now say, oh, the Jesus, Catholic, we have nothing to do with it. How, how did we come to all this uh, chaos? Uh, when Christianity spread out, and not immediately in large numbers, but in very much uh, places, but already still in small communities. They developed a lot of groups that later on became heretic, or has been pronounced to be heretic. 
a, the consolation of what we know later as the Catholic Church is a long process during the third and fourth century and in the end was forced to be brought about since Christianity became the religion of the emperor. Mm -hmm. And the emperor wanted one church and not ten different uh, churches. He wanted one church to talk to. So the Emperor Constantine. Yeah. So he yeah. made the first. He he decided he's going to just now develop a church that will uh, overrule the entire empire. Uh, he still did not force all the empire to be Christian, but he wanted one clear Christian statement. Yeah. So the first Ecumenic Council in Ikea uh, was held under the Emperor Constantine, mm -hmm. and. During that fourth century, I think, eh, on the one side, more and more up to the end of the fourth century, the churches eh, built, literally, built churches upon Gentile temples. Eh, if you look at the cult of Mitra, the Persian sun god, okay, 250 of his temples are found in Italy, more than 200 beneath the church. Beneath the church. So they built the church actually above. To take so, over. And you have the Second Ecumenic Council uh, in Constantinople in the end of the fourth century, and here you now have clear, defined creed of the Catholic Church. Meanwhile, you had another trend among church fathers, and that is to make the creed a philosophically acceptable one. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Justin Martyr, but uh, Origen uh, is a very well-trained philosopher, and he's not the only one, okay? Uh, that is absolutely non-Jewish Hellenistic philosophy mm -hmm. that takes over, but what has been decided in Ikea with the little uh, corrections of Constantinople, it's the binding creed of the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, and the Protestant Church up to this day. Up to this day? Up to this day. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the binding creed that the people declare in every public worship. And uh, there, Jews are just not really mentioned. Okay. That's, that's, where the the Jewish, mild. that's where the Jews really have trouble with. The, the whole Trinitarian dogma is absolutely unconceivable for the Jewish mind, I would think. The Trinity? Yeah. The dogma of the Trinity? That, it's the, a dogma. The, the, the three are one, yeah. but appear to be three. That, that is where, where Jews have That's where the Jews really with. have a very big problem. Right. So, how, how, how do you think the Israelis, the Jewish people, the nation at large, will look at Jesus if the Trinity was not there? It would be much easier. Yeah. Uh, look, as one of my teachers, Professor Schlusser, once put it, that Jesus was murdered by Gentiles. That is a common Jewish... <laughs> it's a common, a common Jewish thing to so do. So many Jews have been killed by Gentiles that he is the son of God. Jews are sons of God. <laughs> okay. All together. We're all the sons of God, says that, the psalmist. That he has been risen from the death. That's a question of faith, but that's not absolutely impossible. So that is not the problem. Okay. Here is not the problem. Uh, and I would say that a lot of Israelis would easily take over the spiritual and personal preaching of the direct relation to God. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of teaching in Christianity, especially in the New Testament, that appeals to young Israeli people. Mm -hmm. It does. Love. Love, forgiveness. Yeah, yes. And not ritual, 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 but right. Right. taking care for your neighbor, having a direct, personal, spiritual relation to God. That, these are things that uh, I think even the most secular Israelis will easily 
uh, understand and uh, take over. A little problem with the messianic claim. Okay. Messianic claim. Yeah. Yeshua being Messiah. That's yeah. a problem. What Jewish tradition understands as messianism is something very, very different from what Christians think. Jews speak about messianism as a kind of salvation of the nation. It's a kind of national thing. That we are that we have been coming back to Israel as part of the messianic program. Okay? And even Orthodox rabbis like Rabbi Cook Cook could understand the coming back to the country as the beginning of the messianic salvation. So what happened? What did the Catholic Church do to this Jewish faith from the early ages? <laughs> yes, what they've done to us. Look, uh, Jewish messianism has different kinds, but it is always, in the ancient times, not in the modern times, the ancient times is national. What happened quite early in the early church was the turn, following Jesus, I believe, the, the turn to the individual mm. and thereby opening up also to non-Jews. And thereby we got a totally different kind of messianism. You believe in resurrection, in life together with Jesus, etc. You are not believing in the freedom of the nation, the salvation of national freedom. Jews at that time, and even the disciples of Jesus, look in the first chapter of Acts, and Jesus appears after his resurrection before the disciples. Oh, Master, are you now coming? Yeah. Say, are you now doing what we expect from you as national messiah to do? Establishing kingdom on earth. God's kingdom or heaven's kingdom on earth. Is that now? They still didn't understand after the resurrection. As Judaism had to rephrase itself after the destruction of the temple. So the early disciples already had to rephrase the belief in Messiah as a belief in personal salvation in a different relationship to God, etc. And that's what happened. Okay. Wow, that was thought-provoking. Let's take a short break now, and when we will get back, we continue with Dr. Mach. Jesus Christ, our last 
Then you start to argue, not only to discuss. Mm -hmm. And that is that's the real argument where Jews have been cast out of the, of the church. It stopped for a while when Augustine refers to the Jews as those people who, outside the Christian church, are the only ones who believe in the divine inspiration of the scriptures. And then Augustine uh, declared the Jews are what in the first book of Moses is kind. Okay. Now not going around having no fixed place, so Jews should be. But you are not executing them because they are testifying to the divine inspiration. By what? At, to the divine inspiration mm, of the okay. Old Testament. Uh, until the moment that the Christian church uh, found out that Jews much more believe in the Talmud than in the Bible. Yeah. And then things switched around somewhere in the 11th, 12th century. Mm -hmm. And then we get the really worth history about that uh, oh, okay. these thousand years. But uh, I think that today, even in Christian theological faculties, people have realized that the replacement theology is the wrong way. Yeah. And since the Second Vaticanian Council, in one of the last decisions, Nostra Aetate, stated that the Catholic Church has to rebuild its relation to Israel in a new way, mm -hmm. which is a very cautious statement, but promising on the other side. Uh, I do believe that most normal theologians would say that the replacement theology was the wrong way. Israel is not to be replaced. And I think Paul got it right. If the church replaces Israel, then God was lying for a thousand years. Right. right. That can't be. Okay? Uh, so I really believe the uh, things are changing today because of the Holocaust. Because of? Of the Holocaust. Of the Holocaust. That has moved a lot of theological thinkers to give their second thoughts about Israel. Yeah, and also suddenly there's Messianic Jews. There's, you know, the, the Jewish people that come to faith yeah. don't have to be absorbed in a Christian church. Like for centuries they had to. Either the, you know you were Jewish or you were Christian. So whenever they came to faith in Yeshua, they had to be in a Christian church. The, the discussions of the church fathers against the Jewish Christians stopped somewhere in the beginning of the fifth century. Okay, but until that time, for at least three centuries, church fathers have argued against Jewish customs for Jewish Christians. Oh, really? Really. And uh, what happens today is absolutely different. You don't yeah. have to go to a Christian church. You can go on to speak Hebrew, for example, and to read your Old Testament in the original language. Mm -hmm. And observe. And observe whatever you want within right. Judaism 
and uh, that's it's about time. Well, this is very enlightening and so interesting. We can clearly see how the Catholic Church took the faith of the Jewish people and then created a rift between them and Yeshua, which in turn caused rabbinical faith to dominate Judaism to this day. Indeed, this is a very sad lesson when we learn all of the wrongdoings committed to the Jewish people over the past 2000 years and all the anti-Semitism that exists till this very day are all part of a cross mistake made by the early fathers of the church. Think about it. The modern Jewish faith is still longing for the Messiah, still awaiting the promises of the Bible to come to fruition. On the other side of this divide, some of the Christian church has most certainly lost its way, forgetting Israel of the flesh, God's chosen and beloved people. So for the church, it took them 2,000 years to really understand and come to, to light, come to terms with this truth that it is of God. This whole thing of Yeshua coming was of God promised loud, sound, and clear by the prophets of Israel. Because here we are, back in the land, and Jews beginning to see Yeshua for who he is. And Michael, thank you so much for being with us. Okay. Yes, thank you. really was great to really get the insight from you. Elisheva, there was so much to learn from this great mm. interview with Dr. Mach. It's a, an amazing topic, a, a very necessary topic mm -hmm. for people to really understand uh, the mindset, the heartbeat of the Jewish people. And I really want to suggest to you, beloved of God, that when you really meet the Jewish people, one of the way to really approach them, rather than putting the emphasis on the Trinity, which is such a stumbling block to them, thank you. I want to I wanna thank you for the word of God. Without you people presenting the word of God to me, old covenant and new covenant, I will be worshiping the idols of this world, the rocks, the moon, the stars. And thanks to you people, I've come into a living relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thanks to the word of God that you have given it to me. It really, for the Jewish people, that is really something, wow, the Gentiles are really thanking me. And then you really want to go on to the next steps. This is the three legs that approaching the Jews should always stand on. The next step, what would it be like for an Israeli or a Jewish anywhere to hear a Gentile coming and telling him, be encouraged. The promises of God to you are yea and amen. <laughs> and the kingdom which God promised you, he's soon going to bring you. Fear not, neither Iran or the Hezbollah or the Hamas or this whole Muslim world who is doing their very best to demolish you from the face of the earth. Fear not, God is with you and he's always been with you. And the promises which God has promised you, he's soon going to bring you as a uh, He's going to really come and reign from Jerusalem, your city, and with presenting the kingdom to your people. And from there you can go to Yeshua. And really, rather than speaking about the Trinity, you can just tell him, tell her, whoever you are approaching, I want to encourage you to reevaluate Yeshua, who walked in the land of promise, healed the sick, Open the eyes of the blind, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, have done great wonders, great miracles, spoken great wisdom, attack hypocrisy and corruption within the religious system. I really want to encourage you, examine him for who he really is in the light of uh, the promises God has given you people in the old covenant, in the light of who Yeshua really is. I think that is a better way of approaching the Jews uh, than forcing on them the Trinity, which raise up the wall of Jericho in their heart. May God bless you, wherever you are. And we do want to pray. We do want to pray. Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our heart. 
for the many, many Christians that are beginning to wake up to the reality of Israel's need for the gospel. And I pray, Father, that you really raise up, raise up among the saints from the nations, not only awareness of the need of Israel for the gospel, but involvement, involvement, interaction among the Jews. May the Lord really convict you, bring conviction upon your heart, and have you understand in the power of the Holy Spirit that time has come to approach Israel. And for that, we're here for you. Trumpet of salvation to Israel that never cease to approach Israel with his glorious promise, kingdom, which God has established in your heart, in our heart, to make us a family, one heart, one spirit, to his glory and to his honor. Shalom, shalom, right from here, Tel Aviv, Israel, and a holy kiss. Yes. And a holy kiss. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom.